Uh, like to approve the minutes of our last meeting on July 18th. I'll make a motion for approval. I have a motion. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? I have a few comments. Um, one is um, under select board concerns. Um, can we just add in that um, I mentioned that a resident expressed concern about e-bikes on the trail going, the, the rail trail going to best. Um, and then, and that the, um, and that we understand it's a, the purview of VTrans and not the town. Um, under number 10, I'd like to add that the select board did request to revisit the setbacks in the town in town uh, setback re requirements. And um, there is an additional community concern um, that that community concerns get moved back to the beginning of the meeting and that we maybe cap it at half an hour and we allow each person five minutes to speak. Uh, and I'm wondering if we can, I know this isn't meant to be a full recap of the meeting, but if we can mention in the community concerns, the proposed changes to the zoning bylaws um, north of Brooklyn Street. Is that, that was the majority of the concern, correct? What was the last um, one again? The, I know that, I know that the minutes are intended to be a full recap, but I'd like to have mentioned that the, the <clears throat> proposed changes to the zoning by, bylaws were, that was um, regarding the, the um, proposed changes to the, the zone north of um, Brooklyn Street, or on North Brooklyn Street. West of Brooklyn Street. West of Brooklyn, north thank of you. Railroad. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I have the affliction of growing up here. I really don't know north and south and many, okay. still many uh, road names. And also um, over the condition of the roads, I think we could also, we could mainly say Cody Hill because that was the, that main concern um, under community concerns. That's all I have. Any others? Brian, you all set? I'm all set. Okay. All those in favor of the minutes as revised? Aye. 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 And oh, wait, we're, I don't have to say opposed, do I, if everybody's agreed? Okay. Moving on. And minutes have been approved. Anything for liquid control? No. Oh, thank you. And on to new business. Introduction of the new Morrisville Village Manager, Scott Johnson. Oh, who's up here? Scott is on the line. He's Sure, we'll, we'll change, we'll move that along. Okay. Next on the agenda is Attorney James Barlow will address ideas regarding the structure of Morristown Development Fund. So I spoke with uh, Barlow and asked him to uh, come and address our MDF, Morristown Development Fund. It's an organization that's been in existence for about four decades. And it's a fund that is available here in town for those. It's like a gap funding, I guess. Uh, Steve Leach is he's the president of the MDF, and there are other members of the MDF here as well. Um, but it's, it's a gap funding for those who might need just a little bit more to get their initial funding for a small business start. Uh, it's also there for folks who are on one of the projects that, again, similar circumstance. Uh, the bylaws are the original bylaws. They're very, very antiquated. They involve personal names in them from the original founders of this fund. The money came from the state of Vermont, uh, economic development uh, section of the state government, and uh, has worked very, very well over the years. But the current board uh, is, is uncomfortable continuing to work under those bylaws because they are so antiquated. So I reached out to Jim, 
uh, as our municipal law uh, specialist and asked him to review the current bylaws and then come and speak to the MDR director about options moving forward, what would be the best options going forward. And that's what Judge here would like to do is to explain what he presented to them. And then I'll have Steve on behalf of the board speak to you about what the board's preference would be to move forward. And then if the board's uh, agreeable with that, a motion in that direction. Do, should we have, since you've already mentioned um, Mr. Barlow, should we still have him introduce himself for the record? Oh, sir. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So I am Jim Barlow. Uh, I'm an attorney here in the state of Vermont. I work exclusively with municipalities and my clients. Um, I've been doing this for a number of years. I used to work for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. I was asked by Eric to take a look at the bylaws and the policies and procedures that are in place for the Morristown Development Fund. Um, it was an interesting project. Um, the, the organization, there, there's, there's the Morristown Development Fund, which is a fund of money that is administered, as Eric said, for community development and loans, bridge loans, uh, to assist economic development in the greater Morristown area. But Morristown Development Fund is also an entity. It is an incorporated nonprofit member organization uh, organized under the laws of the state of Vermont. It was originally set up in 1987 um, as part of a, a process by which some community development funds came to from the state of Vermont to the community, to Morristown. Then those funds come back to the town. Uh, the town retains those and then can use them in a sort of revolving loan type situation to promote economic development in the town. So that's how this money originally came to the community. Uh, as Eric said, when it was formed, this was, it was formed in the entity was formed in 1987. So it was an interesting project to go back and look at the original bylaws, which is, I understand, have never been amended since that time. So we're looking at 31 years now. Um, uh, it is a member organization. The members are referenced as specific people who signed the original articles of association. Um, Anyone can be a member, uh, as long as they're nominated and chosen to be. Um, of course, in type, like a typical nonprofit, you, have, you might think of it as about like the organization of a nonprofit library, where you have members. And then uh, from, uh, typically the members choose a board of directors, but in this case, you folks have the authority to choose the board of directors of the development fund. Um, the, the board of directors is responsible generally for oversight of the day-to-day -day operations of the fund and of the entity, like you folks are responsible for oversight of the operation of the town. And then the, that board of directors has the authority to elect officers, who again, more refinement on the day-to-day -day type of duties. Um, you know, and they're the typical chair, vice chair, treasurer, etc. So there is out there this entity that exists, has existed since 1987. Um, and, and is still there to this day. And that entity, at least in theory, under its policies and procedures, is responsible for administering the fund, the, the, the Morristown Development Fund, um, under the policies and procedures that it's developed for receiving and evaluating loans, making loans, administering those loans, collecting proceeds, things along those lines. So that's basically the organizational structure and how it works. Um, the bylaws look as though they were typed on a typewriter um, back in the day. And the policies and procedures were likely printed on a doc matrix printer, uh, maybe a couple years later. So that's kind of where it's been. And it's a very static sort of, it, it, it is as it was back in the day. Nothing has really changed to sort of address changes in your community. Uh, different approaches of the organization and how, the, how it goes about administering the fund. So I came in, we had this meeting, I sort of laid out this, oh, this is what you are, and this is theoretically on paper how you operate, and which, which resulted in a discussion that was in essence along the lines of, that's great, but that's really not how we operate today. There's a pretty significant gap, Jim, between what you're describing on paper and how we're functioning these days which led to a further discussion about how might things be changed or modified 
to bring uh, the current realities together. So how could we change our bylaws, our policies and procedures, or our operating approach to this to make it more in line with what we're actually doing today? Um, and there were some thoughts about maybe what might be a couple of different directions that might work for the organization going forward based on that discussion. So maybe now or it would be a good time for them to sort of talk about what the thoughts were about how the entity might move forward. Maybe a uh, representative from MDF talking about their thoughts on moving forward. Hi guys, Steve Leach, and I've been on the MDF for a few years. And as you know, some of you that have been here a while, it's not working. Uh, we had a town administrator a few years ago that uh, was very, I'll say, liberal in what he wanted to do with the town money. And as Jim <coughs> had pointed out, this is a fund that is in a nonprofit organization, but it is spilled over into the town now. So Sarah has the money in the in the vault, if you will. It's all she takes care of it. We don't do any of that. We do not. Uh, do anything with the funds after we lend the money. We had an agreement with LEDC and it didn't work, so we came to the town and we've kind of been partnering with the town to do it. And there's a lot of people that don't want to borrow money because they're afraid everybody is going to know their business. So there has to be some changes. The bylaws need to be redone. The way I look at it, and Sam and Marianne are here, if they have anything you want to say, chime in, but they sit on the fund also. We can either put it back the way it was, or we can turn it over to the town, and we would be, uh, we would sit there and make the loans as a, an advisory board to you guys, because if it's town money, you have the final say on it. Basically, I think that's where we are. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I might just sort of maybe help formulate that a little bit. There was a discussion about going in one of two different directions. One where the, the, the um, Morristown Development Fund Incorporated would operate essentially autonomously or more autonomously apart from the town. Likely the finances, the money that's being held would come out of the town and be held by the entity itself under its own uh, taxpayer identification number, they would operate sort of independently, more independently of the town under their own bylaws and under their own policies and procedures. Probably the day-to-day -day management of the loans and the funds would be um, outsourced under a, what might be a loan servicing agreement. So an entity that's uh, like a bank that is familiar with approving, processing, collecting on loans would handle that function. And the board would serve it is in a in a director's function to review applications, um, uh, oversee the operations, oversee the loans, and just on a more on a higher level, uh, you know, oversee the the operation of the fund. So that was option one, sort of the be more independent and go back the way things were. The other option was potentially to um, dissolve the separate entity. Morristown Development Fund Incorporated, and turn those monies under the full control of the town, which essentially would be you folks, with the former uh, development fund directors acting as an appointed committee advising you on sort of the, you know, we think this is a good application, this fulfills the requirements that have been set out, and this is why we recommend this to you. Um, that I think still talking, the, the conversation was the day-to-day -day management of those loans, because that's a pretty sophisticated undertaking to be, you know, uh, putting out loans and, and collecting on them. That also probably would likely be done under a loan servicing agreement with someone who's familiar with that. But perhaps the, um, the town's administration, the treasurer, the finance department would have, um, would be the intersection on the financial part of it with you folks sitting over top of that and making the, the broader decisions in consultation with that, with, with the MDF advisory group, we'll call it. 
So that's really sort of the genesis of what came out of this, this two, two ways to go, two potential paths. And it, it was Eric's idea that maybe we bring this to the board and give us some direction. Yeah, the, uh, I think the other thing is, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the stand right here. They're, they are really leaning toward the advisory format in that if the, the monies are uh, overseen through the town, then the town should be the final say. And although it sounds like a rubber stamp, it actually is a three different entity, three sets of eyes looking into the documents. The outsourced bank processing the loan, coming up with their recommendation, going to the MDF. The MDF now taking a look at it and their consideration whether or not this is a, a good risk or not. And then them coming to the select board and saying, this is what the bank has said, this is what we feel, we think this is a good, a safe bet. And, and obviously if the bank or the MDF, either entity says, this is too risky, we're not gonna do it, you wouldn't even see that. You'll only see them come to you with a, a loan that they feel strongly about that is a good risk to, to get out there. That, that's the direction they would like to go in. Uh, we have a tremendous uh, community full of very wise business folks. And it's a business mindset that staffs this board. Uh, they're familiar with loan processing. They're familiar with these business plans and planning. Uh, so they're, they're very capable of doing that part of it in their advisory capacity. But the thought of sitting on a board where they have final say did not, they didn't uh, really come with that at all. It, uh, and it did seem that this would be a third set of eyes to ask even more questions. So uh, without making it too cumbersome or too lengthy a process, where you know when we get an application, or when the MDF gets an application, they will immediately do their review, send it to the bank with their processing, and when it comes back to them with the bank's say approval, they will look at it even closer before making the vote to bring it to you folks for the order of I'm just curious, um, how many times a year do you think you go through this process, or you would be? We haven't done it for a few years because it's so cumbersome. None of us feel like we can do it. it there's way too much for a volunteer board. And some of it is on us as a town to let entrepreneurs know that these funds are available for this. And it's, they're, they're, the bylaws will have rules and guidelines and procedures in it so that they will be able to read and follow and to see if it fits their business model. So just a couple of basic questions. Starting off, how much money are we talking in the fund? It's, yeah. And what would a, and what would a typical loan be? We've had them anywhere from 5,000 for computers to uh, 150,000 for new machinery and a food processing plant. And this is all for small business startup, basically. Yes. Well, yeah. not startup, but it might be somebody that, that needs some money just to put new computers in there. I'm asking basic questions because I'm not that familiar with MDF at all. I think you've already answered this question, but there is a current board right now. Yes. And yourself and Sam and Marianne. Mary could you could you Peter give Merrill. us Peter? Could you give us the full names of everyone? Just for the record. Just for the record. Peter Merrill, Sam Guy, Marianne Wilson, myself, and Bob Beeman sits as a liaison from the select board. Okay. Um and I'm Sarah Haskin, some like but uh, I don't even know my role, but I'm somehow involved with something. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love you guys to pick one way or another. <laughs> your, your name was mentioned. It's in my notes here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on the paperwork, but I don't sit on the advisor role. Seeing that anybody else would be. So I think I'm just there for signing. Um, so I guess maybe my last question on was, uh, you know, what suggestions you might have, but it sounds like you're already giving us a suggestion that that option number two, um, which sounded pretty good to me as well. And, and that maybe you've already answered this question too, but it sounds like 
these applications wouldn't necessarily be competitive, like one new business entity competing with another business entity for the money, just them coming to you and trying to convince the board that Correct. that they're they're worthy of, of that money. And one reason, just so you know, that this has to be done, and there was just a local business that borrowed some money. They paid it back six, eight years ago. Their mortgage was never discharged. So when they came to sell, hmm. that showed up and we had to jump through some hoops to get it done so they could sell their, their business. And if that's the kind of thing that they just fall through the cracks and because nobody, we don't have any anybody that works for us. And, and we're always in a second position. Usually, so yeah. Never end up. Who would be do? Who would be rewriting the bylaws? Would the committee be doing that? Jim. Or Jim would be doing and the, and the, I would assume you guys and us. Okay. Sorry, and thanks. and either either option would include an outsourcing of the the administration of the yes. loans. Yeah. So that would solve maybe the the that cumbersome issue where you can't really do all that administration. Right. Because right. you guys don't want. Yeah. And that's how it has been. And the Union Bank has been servicing any. <clears throat> okay. And this is and something. People make their payments to the bank. This is something if we try this, I think it's a good thing. If we can change it, it's not working yeah. at any time. Yeah. What's the process for changing the bylaws? That's very interesting. Um, well, we have to remember that this money didn't just fall out of the sky. Okay, and uh, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development brought this money to the, to the town. And that money came with, um, most likely from HUD, under federal regulation. So this process of transferring from the MDF Incorporated to control by the town, I estimate we're going to have to have this plan at least run by and approved by the Agency of Commerce and Community Development because ultimately they still retain some measure of oversight and responsibility for it. So I, I would anticipate going to them and saying, this is what we anticipate doing. Um, technically, I think it, it probably um, would take the form of something along the lines of an asset transfer agreement, which basically between MDF Incorporated and the town saying, we anticipate and will transfer these funds over to you, the town, for your control and oversight under these parameters that have been approved by AC, ACCD. And then ultimately the dissolution of uh, MDF Incorporated as a separate entity. Okay, so they just sort of evaporate and go away after we've got a plan to transfer funds and oversight of the funds over to you folks. So, cool. would, it, so would it be called something else? And how would people ask? It Maybe would, that's a question for the board. It would be your, it, I, I would anticipate it would still be called the Morris Town Development Oh, got Fund, you, uh-huh. But it's just <laughs> under the oversight, completely under the oversight and auspices of the town. Of the town. Of Morris mm -hmm. Town, rather than having this other entity out there mm -hmm. in the wings. I think the, the board themselves had been discussing changing the name just slightly to add the word loan. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't sound like it's a mm -hmm. grant fund, but specifically mm -hmm. it's all the funds. So there's an expectation for payback. Mm -hmm. So excuse my adjective here, but would it be a simple vote of the select board that would make this happen, or would it be an article that would go to the town? It would be the, in my estimation, it would be the select board's decision to make it happen and to execute the agreements uh, to do that. It would not have to be, it would not be something that is voted on in town meeting. Okay. Okay. So you need a, a motion from the board? I would uh, entertain a motion or a, for a motion that uh, approves Mr. Barlow to continue in the process of rewriting the bylaws with the. Uh, End goal being that MDF becomes an advisor to the select board, and the select board has final say. I hope someone got that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make that my motion. Okay. Judy got it. <laughs> Do I hear a second? A second. 
Any discussion? One point of clarification. Sure. I think it's important that the, the loans, if they come to the administrator's office, that the MDF board looks at them and gives a yay or nay before they go to the bank right. to keep the town more or less out of it until the final step because there's a lot of people that do not want to borrow from the fund because they think that, oh, everybody's going to know what I write down on here. So just to kind of keep as much as we can, keep their information private. And we feel pretty firmly that that can happen. With Mr. Darnold's uh, writing the rules of procedure within the bylaws with that very thing in mind. So we don't have to put that in the motion. That'll no. be in the bylaws. No, it'll be a part of what product that he generates. Okay. I just wanted it to be clear. Sure. Is there I, anything else? I would just say I would assume the four of you are going to continue to be part of this MDF as long as into the, the near future. As long as the bylaws will allow us. Right now, there's a 15-year period. Oh. Okay. So we get you for another 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 And the motion is passed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Do we have uh, Scott back with us yet? No, he's not back. I'm happy to finally, um, James, put a face to a name. There he goes. Yeah. <laughs> I had him pictured of somebody who looks so very different, so it's good to see him. Yeah. The actual He's person. Oh. Through our door. I know. <laughs> I thought he was an older, going to be an older gentleman and kind Same. of like 5'10 yeah. or something. Same. <laughs> so that picture. Yeah. So uh, Scott Johnstone has a text to me, and the internet is out of his house. So oh. Tonight, we'll bring back right okay. All right. So the next uh, on the agenda is approve the grand list errors and omissions, Morristown Real Estate, LLC. Make a motion to approve it. Can can we just have an explanation on that? Is yeah. this it, whose property is this? Or I guess after we second it, we yeah, can guess this. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Discussion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Could uh, can we just get some uh, insight sure. into who's there was a grievance filed in this email. Yes. There was. So the email is they passed it. For some reason, it did not reach folks by the deadline. And they brought in the email with everything they printed. They said, how could I not get a grievance hearing? I filed on time. The mysteries of what caught. So uh, Terry saw the date and time stamp. They heard the grievance, and they made an adjustment to the value on the property. This is the a, sorry, go ahead. They're changing it down $60,900. And this was from the recent um, appraisals? Uh, no, not, not the reappraisal that we're on going. No, this oh. is uh, an annual event for tax city tax grievance procedure. Okay. Did you want to say anything, Dwayne? Not necessarily, but I can. <laughs> to describe the property, it's the land across from Rock Art where the house was business was just built. Mm -hmm. The whole land goes behind the uh, house down on uh, Wayport Road, was included in the same site grade as where the house was built, which was adjusted, and that's the $60,900 piece. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, so, any other discussion? So this is coming to us because this normally wouldn't, the board, <laughs> the board of Abatement wouldn't take care of this normally. No, this is this is an admitted uh, error omission. That's the name, uh, and the listeners uh, in Terry have gone over this property and made their adjustment here. And in fact, when I read the note here, it says owner sent a grievance request in time, but had the email address incorrect. Request was timely, so they mistyped the email address. Fine. Yeah. Not, not to step on the listeners' toes, Dwayne can. Um, Correct me, but the process for the new board members is once the grand list has been lodged, any changes that need to be made from now through December 31st have to be run and approved. And there may be others. By you, 
and there may be other. Um, there typically are, especially like I don't know, homestead declarations because the deadline is after. So um, you may see more of these. Then after December thirty first, no changes can be made to the grant. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? All set. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion is passed. Um, next on the agenda, proposed street name ordinance. Yes. So last fall, I brought the same street ordinance, street name ordinance. Uh, you approved it, adopted it, and the process goes. And I missed the deadline. It completely went away on my desk after the meeting, and I um, it brought back my attention a couple months later. She assumed that it had gone through and it was fine. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't important to you, but I didn't get the deadlines for advertising the ordinance changes that we've been through recently with the noise ordinance. Uh, so I'm bringing it back to you to ask you once again to adopt this. We will reset that clock and start the process of adopting this in a legal manner. So we're, this is kind of like the going back to the first reading. Is that what this is, sort of? Um, mm -hmm. Sure. That means the changes you have here. This is the same document that I presented to right. you last fall. Right. Uh, not, we've changed it. I have nothing with it. It was so, just simply that I missed the deadlines. Do we have to, like, if we, we go, okay, we approve this tonight, then do, do we have to wait uh, some more time period for yeah, that? Yeah, the process calls for a, a time period of about 60 days during which there can be an appeal by taxpayers of uh, voters if they get 5% uh, of the voter checklist to sign a petition to stop this. Okay, and the big, um, the big um, point of discussion was around posting uh, the the e e nine one one number on your house. Is that correct? Was that the big? I think that was the, the biggest the piece. Change? Yes, okay. I I believe. Okay, if I remember correctly, yeah. Brian, how there about was, you? There were some very outdated penalties written in the oh, right. mm -hmm. one that made no sense whatsoever. Uh, those were This was a, a freshening of an ordinance that is important, but can run out of date. Did you have anything to add, Brian? No, sounds good to me. Okay. I remember it went on. Went on for a while. No. No. Um, uh, do we hear a motion? Okay. I'll make a motion. We adopt the uh, Article 080711B, street naming and street numbering. Second. And a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? So basically, this is the exact same wording as what was passed last fall. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion has passed. Okay, next on the agenda, review bids for financing Ford F-250. So I submitted four bids to um, banks. I only got two back. Uh, my recommendation is to go with the lower interest rate, which is 3.39% of the union bank. I make a motion we do that. I have a motion of a second. I can second. Any discussion? And this is for the highway department. Right, okay. How does this fit into our budget? Great, thank you. And this includes a warranty, like we're doing. This does. Oh, sorry, Kevin. Like, usually wearing your blaze. <laughs> you approved the truck. Yes, we did. Oh, now we're the loan. Okay. This is how we're going to pay for it. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions or discussion? No, it's just interesting the Union Bank always comes in lowest and significantly lower. Yeah. It's not much of a well, we, do, we do have banking business with other banks in the community. We have, we have done other business with other banks. So yeah. This is the, the, uh, the breakdown is interesting because it's smidges apart. We're only talking sometimes a tenth of a percent, but every tenth is worth money. I have a motion to second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion has passed. On to old business. So just to 
you guys know there will be long documents to sign from the end of the week. Okay. okay. You'll send us out a, a an email. Great, thank you. Eric, do we have any other old business? Okay. And a motion to approve warrants. We don't have anything to sign tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's just stuck over here. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve warrants. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is passed. Approval of warrants is passed. Town Administrator's report. So, I'll uh, change my, my uh, order in which I'm reporting this because I did do a comment about the device last week. And I reached out to uh, Jackie Casino, who is the head of uh, the state of Mont's rail trail uh, oversight. Uh, she has a nice title. I don't know exactly what it was, but she is she was hired in April to oversee the, the adoption of all the rail trails in the state and uh, undertaken by uh, the Department of Transportation. So, um, I talked to her about different issues, not the least which is mowing. The state is uh, important one they're only going to mow once this calendar year and twice next calendar year. And we have had a volunteer in our community mowing that trail from through Morrisville and into Fire High Park for a couple of years now uh, on a couple of weeks basis. So it's a lot of things to do. So um, that has ended. The liability of the state will not allow volunteer work like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to contract out with the mowing. She's indicated that going uh, down the road, the louder the voices, the more apt the uh, trans is to adopt a third mowing at the very least. As I said, you know, from the beginning of the year, the grass is going the fastest. Something before the weather would be nice, just to fulfill the weather would be nice, and then perhaps in the box. The grass is slowed down by that. Perhaps that would get us a balance that we could work with twice a year to really walk in the United States. So, uh, anyway, she just encouraged me to speak to the legislative delegation to put pressure on them to have a third home. As the e bikes, this is the first time that they had a complaint or heard of a complaint of the speed of the e bikes, but not really surprised that they, they put very long. And I just asked, I said, there is a rail trail speed limit for snowmobiles in the wintertime. Didn't know if they considered anything about e bikes in the summer. They have not yet, but she did that. So they'll, they'll discuss it some time. Thanks for following up on that. No problem. Uh, I attended the Conservation Commission meeting um, last week and talked to them about the possibility of them being an additional group of eyes to help us in the beginning of it. To, uh, as we are still waiting for our permit to come through. Um, but that if they would be so kind as to help us to monitor for any outcroppings of Japanese knotweed and the invasives mm -hmm. that we have up there, we really appreciate it. It's another 300 plus acre, acre parcel. They already named the town forest, which is over 300 acres. Um, so I'm not expecting miracles from the group of volunteers. For that. But I, I thought perhaps if they were just you know, sometimes a year, maybe just took a walk around the edges up there and take a walk and see if they spot anything. So, if you know, there is spread, we can catch it quick. Um, yeah. So, they're there, and they're going to take it back to talk about it and go from there. Uh, then, doing and the finishing up the employee annual reviews and goal settings and going very, very well. Uh, such a great group of folks here, motivated and uh, looking for more education, which we're looking to not get that that way. And as of today, the 1111 permit came in from the state of Vermont, so we now have our permits uh, in line to continue and complete the work for the Bridge Street parking lot, which is right okay. in right yeah. the bypass. Yeah. So that is an additional parking, not necessarily in the center of the downtown, but the parking is better needed. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And when, when's that slated to be finished? We really don't have a, a timetable. There's there's a uh, obviously a sunset on the grant to catch forty thousand uh -huh. dollars match, but uh, we are late in the construction season now. The work that we have left to do uh, is the final grade paving, sidewalk work, stuff that our guys aren't going to be doing. So it's dependent upon the contract. So 
I don't know if we're going to fall in line on, especially the sidewalk. There's a, a movement, a movement of the sidewalk that needs to take place. The, uh, the intention here is for the bus, the parking lot bus, to not go down into the parking lot because they turn around and eat up two parking spaces on one side and one on the other. So we're moving the sidewalk into a, uh, a, a not a bump out of the road, the opposite, right? The bump out of the sidewalk to allow the space for the bus to pull in and stop and pick up passengers without interfering with the flow of traffic on Bridge Street. So that the sidewalk's going to be uh, redesigned. We're talking water and light about the possibility of moving the fire hydrant uh, just a little further up Bridge Street, get it away from the sidewalk so it's not right on top of it. But we're, uh, we're good. If they don't, don't move it, then we're still we're still okay. It would just be better for not talking about that. But the hydrant right away from the sidewalk. So, uh, but as far as the definitive date and end time, it may perhaps be the spring of the year before we get back up down that sort of piece of the most difficult this late in the year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Eric? No. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Take any from the public? Um, during community concerns. I, I just wanted to ask, is there a sign coming soon for the parking ride? Uh, I don't believe we've ordered any signs yet. Okay. What are you fighting Japanese not leaving them? What are you fighting it with? Yeah, what are you, what are you fighting it with? <laughs> what are you fighting it with? We don't, we don't fight Japanese not. No. Because well, uh, you, you're not going to win, first of all, but uh, you can manage it. Which in the, in the Duhamel Pit is the only area that we are seeking to manage the Japanese not. We have uh, a couple of outcroppings uh, in the area where our hall road is slated to go. Those uh, outcroppings have been cut as of uh, last week, the week before, uh, the foliage is left in place, and the large mound of old ditch material was hauled in, nobody can remember when, that is covered with knotweed, that has been cut down as well. And we have a company that we've hired to come in to manage that. It's going to be, after one month, he comes back in with the new shoots, the new growth starting, he does a direct application of Roundup uh, on those things, and then we'll cover the all those locations with a tightly woven mesh uh, to prohibit growth. Uh, it is not a one-time application winner. Uh, it's probably going to take us several years to manage, maintain, uh, and hold those at bay. And we'll see how successful we are. This is not new technology, but uh, it's, it's what we, we need to do responsibly and uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to find in our permit when it comes that will be a, a, a big piece of this. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks. This is a, an aside, and, um, <clears throat> but sort of related to the um, the parking ride. Will there be any? Um, is there any? Are there any provisions for bike parking or anything like that? I don't know if there are on this, but I guarantee that could be worked into the project. All right. Cool. Any other questions for Eric? Nope. Okay. Well, set. Um, select board concerns. We'll start with Brian. I'm all set. Jess? I wanted to um, just follow up, um, and I apologize for not doing this um, beforehand um, during the week, but I'm wondering if we've had any um, movement or information around um, getting um, Zoom set up for um, planning commission or what the process is for um, for implementing that, if that's um, if that's a big budget issue or if that's a location issue. I just wanted to um, circle back on that one. I, I would say that if that is the, if the select board wants to take down the support boards, then they want them all to be on Zoom that that is your choice to do so mm -hmm. to bring it up uh, at a later meeting as an agenda item just okay. action it. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to take a lot of staff mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just having the dollars to pay it it's, it's to find the available staff if not hiring it out and that's not always cost effective as other municipalities are already found out um, but we will certainly look into it here that's the this select board's decision is that the subordinate boards that we will seek to find out what those costs are and uh, we can budget for it. Okay.
Um, thank you. And then um, I just also wanted to say I attended another <clears throat> parking committee meeting um, this week, or was that this week? Last week. Um, we're still making progress um, looking at maps of the town and um, how we can possibly, you know, make more parking. So it's just an ongoing process. And um, Todd was able to coordinate with Eric and Kevin and with um, Jason Leno, um, Leno, sorry, um, to um, have them come in and um, get their um, get their read on um, some of our ideas, the feasibility and and, and um, you know the um, enforcement questions. So yeah. that's it. Yeah, I think. Done. So just a couple of things. I um, <clears throat> I met with Tina last week and had my Morristown Financing 101 class, my first class, and uh, very interesting speaking with her and listening to her and realizing the uh, complexities of managing the finances in this town. I can't say as if I walked away from that meeting with a huge understanding of how it all works, but I have a lot of respect for her and, and what, what she's doing and, um, and what all is happening in this office to, to make sure this town is run pro properly financially. I had a meeting with Ryan Harity as well up at the uh, up at LSUU, Lamont South um, Unified Union, in regards specifically to capacity in our schools. And we had a great conversation <clears throat> Actually, the first time I had sat down and talked to him, even though I've been under contract with, with him for a little while, but um, safe to say that when it comes to schools, um, well, his word, when I asked him the direct question about capacity in Morristown, his answer was plenty. And um, he did give me a pretty detailed listing of all the data from 2012 to 2021, so the last 10 years, and you can look at the data, and it um, there is a decline in every in every area. In the elementary school, there's a decline of almost 17 percent. In the middle school, a decline of 8 percent, and in the high school, a decline of three and a half percent over the course of those 10 years. I certainly don't want to take away from the importance of the discussion of development that's going on in this town right now. I have concerns about the development going on in this town, but I think it's safe to say schools are not the issue, not right now. That's not to say they're not going to be in 10 years time or 15 years time or whenever. Um, and then the last thing, I, I just want to echo what, what Jess said. I've had a number of emails and um, requests about Planning Commission, Planning Council meetings in particular, but I guess all of our subordinate boards and uh, the suggestion that maybe we get them in Zoom. So I, I also would be interested in just the cost. And I, I appreciate what you said, Eric, it's not just the money, but it's the manpower. It's, it's the person power, it's getting someone to get in there and do it. But uh, clearly, there's, uh, clearly there's people in town that would like to see that, see that happen. So. I, I guess I'd like to see that addressed. I'm not saying anyone's not addressing it, but I think it's something that we do need to talk about a little bit going forward. I don't think it's gonna go away. And that's all I got. Thank you. Um, I like to, I forgot to mention that Bob is not here tonight. He's trying to get back from his job work, was working in Europe. So the, the airports weren't cooperating with him getting here on time. And um, I want to apologize because I didn't have a chance to eat anything before the meal, before the meeting. So I may be snacking up here, and I apologize. I think it's rude for me to do that, but I'm I'm going to fade and fall over if I don't chew on something. But I, um, my I don't have a concern. I wasn't here when we offered Eric the the uh, uh, the position, the full time position, and I was on the. Um, uh, committee to uh, hire the, the new um, administrator for our town. And I had reservations about hiring Eric because he didn't have the experience. And I was very concerned about that, but he has since like blown any of my concerns out of the water. He's very competent, um, he's very caring. He's an excellent writer. He's very articulate. 
and he's been the visionary. And so I've been very, very impressed. And I just want to make that point out loud. So thank you. Thank you. And that's all I have. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go on to community concerns. I'd like to mention that please come up to the microphone, address the board, and introduce yourself with your concern. I'd like to know, we, we're doing a magnificent job on time tonight, so I'm excited. Um, I might be able to get home and eat dinner at a reasonable hour, and many of you too. How many people would like to speak this evening? Two? Just two? Okay. Um, would you like to come up first? Sure. <clears throat> My name is Kristen Mayer, and my, I, um, I guess the question how it could be charged into the bylaws that any change in zoning density can be voted on by the electorate in the town instead of relying on like a five to 12 person board to make that decision. And what would the procedure for that be? That's a, it's a good question, and I I don't know if anybody here has that answer. I don't know if it's a state statute or not. You don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, Eric, if you have a comment about that? For my years on the select board, with the zoning bylaws, uh, adoptions or edits that are made on the annual basis. Just density changes, that would be it. That would be what I mean. I don't know if we could pick and choose. I don't know, no. but I don't know. I don't but know. I don't know we can pick and choose. It seems to me in the government, in many cases where you're talking about regulations, because the zoning bylaws when they come to the board are being adopted for regulation purposes that the DRD would then enforce. I, I'm not sure how we would um, pick and choose which of the zoning bylaws would necessarily be voted on by the voters, mm -hmm. but the process we currently have is, is public and very public. Um, so I don't know. I, it's, it's a good question. I'll look into it. Yeah. But I, I don't know what the exact answer is. I just only got tells me select, selective uh, government is not really welcomed in most places. So to select one I don't like I'm just not feeling that would be the way it would work but I'll look into it. And I think the other is and I, I'm not don't quote me on this because I don't know for sure. But I think the state has, I don't know if they've mandated, but highly suggested that there's high density building in certain parts of your towns and villages. So we keep the sprawl from happening and keeping Vermont rural as much as possible. And I don't know that whole um, aspect of that, but I know that that's part of the push. And so medium density, high density is in that mix. But I, I don't have all of those answers for you. Does that make any sense? Maybe someone but else does? Yeah. <clears throat> so could that be found out by maybe the next meeting so that I could? Possibly, yes. Thank you. I don't want to promise, but I'll, I'll do my best. Okay. Did anybody else have anything to say? I would, I would, re I would reflect what our um, reflect back what you're saying about there being a state mandate around um, the infill, um, the infill development in town centers as a means to um, curb development or curb sprawl. Um, and I, you know, I do recognize that that doesn't. I mean, I'm also a, a village resident. I mean, it's. It's a give and take, um, but I, I have read that as well. So I'm I could find the source of that, but and then the the next the bigger question of zoning going um, to the electorate um, that sounds like the Eric question Eric and Todd question. Uh, Tom, don't you come up? Yeah. Uh, my name is Tom Fulia. Uh, you know, I'd just like to make a comment that uh, about setting rules on how long people can talk. And uh, 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 five minutes, or and, and it goes on for a half hour. Now, I've been on Watson board for like four years now. And this board, I can tell you, I know you work hard. I know you work hard off hours, going to like all go to different meetings and everything else. And you, and uh, we appreciate that. But you only meet us twice a month, and you give us 
say an hour. That means the people who talk to you have two hours a month to express their grievances or express their thanks for how well you're doing. So I, I would highly recommend you not wait any limits on how many people are going to talk. You've got five minutes. They'll follow a minute and a half hour or anything like that. And uh, if the somebody comes up here, like I might be doing over state in like three minutes, your leadership on the board can shut that down in a nice way. And uh, that would solve the five minute rule or whatever it is. And the other point I want to make is I think we're really concerned about this development coming up Brooklyn Street and, uh, and who knows what's going to happen. I think what we're seeing now is, is we'll have to wait to see how, just how bad it's going to be, or maybe it's going to be that. And if we put some sort of moratorium on this building and see what's going to happen, then I think everybody would feel a little bit better. And unless you can like guarantee me or give, assure me that, say, a, a funeral home, for, for instance, was sold to a developer, and the developer decided to put 120 units in it. That won't happen. And I don't know if you guys can assure me that right now. No, that's not our purview. No. Thank you. It will be, though. Won't you have to vote on it? Well, once the planning council goes through the procedure that they have in front of them yeah. on changing any zoning, yeah. and then they have a hearing and they go through the process, right. then it does come to the select board to approve or disprove. Okay. And I think this is kind of like a fair warning that there's a lot of people up there that probably don't want to see that. I think we all read that front porch forum postings. <laughs> well, I mean, you can see it here. Too. Yes, yes. So, and we get emails too. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Tom. Much. I appreciate it. Nancy? <laughs> <laughs> Not to beat a dead horse, but I guess my concern once again is development in the town and um, how the actual change of median density residential happened in 2017. Looking through all the minutes back from day one, we cannot clearly see where it has actually changed in the median density residential on our side of town. It changed in Fairway Lights, it was very clear, but there's no specific conversation in the minutes stating that it changed on our side. So we're really concerned about how that happened, but we don't even see it in the paperwork. Um, and through conversations with a number of people, I know that even some members of the select board were not really aware of the consequences to that decision, how it would affect the rest of the town when they took the multifamily out of the medium density residential. So I think there wasn't enough research and thought put into that change when it happened. Um, Brooklyn Heights, I live in Brooklyn Heights. We're not opposed to multifamily homes by any means in medium density residential. We're opposed to multifamily and high density. There's a huge difference. It'll change the whole character of that street. The traffic is already atrocious coming out of Brooklyn Heights and going into town. There's 10 to 15 cars back, where we're not supposed to have any traffic anymore. Um, and then the last piece was, I don't know if there's a study about the growth of the town. Right now, according to Todd, there's 427 new addresses on the books from RSL. There's only 550, the population is 5,500 in Mars, correct, about that. That's a huge percentage of new people in such a small town. I don't think it's a, a, a smart way to move forward. I mean, it took <coughs> many years to get 5,500 people, and now we're going to bring 500 in every year is really the way it seems. So anyway, I really would like everybody to go back and see and explain to us how the change happened, where, in the minutes, because that's not clear to us. Could you just, for the record, just state your name? Nancy, Pr Nancy Pritchard. Thanks. So, Nancy, I did a little bit of research, and I can answer a tiny bit of your, one of your questions. And because Brian and I are the only ones on the board right now who were there, Bob was, but he's not here tonight. And and I haven't talked to Brian, but I'm assuming he remembers when we made that change, 
And and um, when the change was made about the Fairwood Parkway um, area, changing the density, it was not clear that it was going to change anywhere else because the only change right now that is that is impact that that zoning change uh, change made was to the Faith Funeral Home property because many of the other places on there are already multifamily homes. So nobody knew that that property was going to go up for sale and the funeral home wasn't going to be there any longer. So the, there wasn't, we didn't know what we didn't know at that time. So it's always been going back and saying, oh, there was an er maybe an error made several years ago. We did, but those of us sitting on the board, nobody knew in town that that funeral home was going to go under. With the faith funeral home, I mean that is what it is. I think that if it was what it was before, a multi-family, medium density, mm -hmm. they could put six units there. More power to them. No, no complaints about that. Seventeen units, yes, I have a complaint about that. And I think um, once again, the change in Fairwood Heights <coughs> affected way more than just Fairwood Heights. They're now low density residential. They're not even part of medium density residential. So. When you make a mistake, we're all taught in life, you make a mistake, you fix it. You don't kind of and I, I think roll the, forward. I think the planning council is working on okay. that. And that's where it has to be. We can't fix yes. it. Well, we keep running into a wall. Every place we go, we're set. Oh, this isn't the proper place to talk about it. This right. isn't the proper oh, you place. Can talk, you can talk about it, but we, we can't go, we can't change it, is what I'm saying. Who can change The planning council. But, but we can we email them directly? I assume, yeah. Can I clarify just a little bit? Sure. I want to make sure we're all talking very clear okay. on the process. Planning Council deliberates, and the meeting a couple of weeks ago that we all attended was a, was an invite to get the public input. And I wonder if that's an So they're hearing their voices very loudly. Yeah. Once a year, Planning Council brings bylaw proposal, either new or edited, and it's already there, to the select board for review in a public hearing. During that hearing, public input on any one individual bylaw that can be singled out and had. And at the end of the hearing, the hearing is closed. At the next regular select board meeting, there will be a vote by the board to adopt all or some of the proposed bylaws. So your voices are very important during that hearing process when the board has brought the proposed changes to the bylaws. <coughs> very important at that time. It, not, they're not important now because I I it's not for long to live here um, and I've heard and seen it. Um, so I have more to come. Uh, there, your voices uh, won't be stopped. Your voices will definitely be heard. But the strongest time will be heard is during that open public hearing, and it's going to come later this fall. Okay, but well, I just want to reiterate one thing. Um, it, in the minutes, it was clear that Todd had agreed to uh, pretty much directly. Uh, get some input from the neighboring properties that would be affected on Brooklyn Street of the change that was happening, but it never actually happened until this June when we got a letter stating it was said three times he was going to do it. I don't have the dates, but it didn't happen until June. And I think if we had known three years ago, you know, we had a little bit better uh, ground right now. I mean, right now it feels very frustrating. And I, I'd have to go back to, and I mean, I could be really wrong. I would have to go back to that that there wasn't any change happening on Brooklyn Street because the faith property was intact and it was it was a funeral home and no building was going to go on there. That's what I'm that's what I'm going off of. That's might be why nothing went out because nothing was happening at well, that the time. Multi, the multi-family piece of medium density residential was removed. We are all multi-family. Properties were all now non conforming properties in our own neighborhood where we have permits to build our homes and permits to live there. I think that's. And, and, right. I, and I don't know how, I don't know how the zoning works that if they change the density, they change the density um, language if the property owners are notified. I don't know. No. I don't know how that works. They're not. Works. So. And just an example, Todd was very clear about it. So, an example of it is if your property, Brooklyn Heights, part of our property was to burn down today, 
and we couldn't get our insurance to pay up and by three years and rebuild. We couldn't. The town would not give us the permission to do it. I think that's a problem. I personally think it's a cloud on title, but an attorney told me it wasn't. But I think that's a real problem. If a multifamily home burns down in town, it takes a long time to get that insurance money and rebuild. These are investments, you know, they're not just chunk change. So. And, and this is way above my pay grade. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What concerns me is that, is that our voices are playing for a council meeting. It doesn't matter right now. It's not going to matter until they get it all written. And then what, what can we do? But I, think, but I think they're listening to you because I was at I was at the meeting and people are listening to you. They're taking it down. No one's listening to us. They didn't even give us an opportunity to to make suggestions. I heard a lot of people. I heard a lot of people speaking at that meeting. Well, I hope I hope I'm wrong. I really do. I hope I'm wrong. But uh, they made us stick to the agenda. They, there was no section about community concerns. Yeah. They, the, 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 they, they don't have to do that. So, well, so then how do we say our concerns? We're trying to get on the agenda for a while. So I, see, that this is the problem. Again, again, this they is... They don't the, have to do it, but don't you think they should could give the people an opportunity to give their input before they finish their report? Well, I think that, that that's what the hearings are for, and I don't know where they are in their process. Well, they are. Well, I was at the meeting, as long as we want to talk about the agenda they had in front of them, they didn't want to hear anything else. Well, I understand that. Usually you have, when you have a meeting, you do follow the agenda. I understand so, that. You have suggestions on what we should do. I don't have any suggestions for you right now. But, but how well, are we supposed to proceed if the town government doesn't know how we should proceed? I, I, I am not on the planning council. I'm not quite sure how they're, uh, they're, they run their meetings and how that works. Don't make the pick on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, Believe me, I, I met with a, a voter last week, a taxpayer voter, because they did not understand the government process. And I understand that too, because the board sat on the select board for a large number of years and then sat in this job to get even deeper understanding. The town government process is a mystery to most homeowners. It really is. What I explained earlier, uh, I'll reiterate, but I want to get brief. Planning Council develops zoning bylaws based on needs of the community and, and forward development. It doesn't mean they're disregarding what you're saying. They're trying to solve the problem of the Faith Funeral Home, which is surrounded by multifamily housing. And I appreciate very much what Nancy said about the fact that multifamily well, housing, six, seven units, we've got we have no problem. 17 units they have issue with. That public hearing in the fall, if in fact the zoning the, the planning council brings that specific bylaw, written as was talked about in the meeting, in front of the board or in a public hearing, that is when those voices get spoken from the audience and, and speak them strongly. And that you oppose that, you know, that one bylaw change. That is where you're talking to the select board during the adoption process. The planning council does not adopt bylaws. They only suggest them based on current trends or current uh, building and problems that they've run into that the bylaws have either been outdated or they may not exist. Maybe they're creating a whole new bylaw sometimes. So that public hearing in the fall is absolutely Tom, where you have your voice heard in this venue, in front of this board, because this board is the one that makes the decision to adopt the bylaws, not the planning council. Can I, can I ask a question? Um, does do the people in attendance now have a request or a set of like requests that they would like to see instead of what it seems that the planning council is proposing? Yeah, we'd like to have that like, multi-family meeting density residential. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. I and that's I. I'm always looking for the the actionable item. So thank that's you. The easiest yeah. Way to do it. Yeah. Right, no, right, many many right. But you don't want high density no. allowed. Okay. So I think I know how our meetings run. If you want to be on the agenda here, you want to talk about something, you go to Eric and you tell him you want to be on the agenda and they'll put you on. Then you've got a spot. 
this community concerns is something we've added a few years back just to be thank you yes mm -hmm. more for three times yeah but that that's here i don't know how todd runs it i would think it'd be the same you could get on the agenda because we aren't allowed to talk to about stuff here if it's not on the agenda because everybody out there and they didn't come tonight had no idea you were going to talk about it so who is the agenda Oh, well, here for, it's Eric. For planning council, it's Todd. He develops the agenda. Okay. Right now, they have a limited amount of meetings between now and that public hearing One. to finalize. Yeah, it's very, very few to finalize that bylaw presentation that you're going to see during the public hearing. Yeah. So they had the open public discussion a couple weeks ago about that zoning bylaw change. They had great turnout. They heard those voices loudly. I can tell you from the talk here in these halls, you were heard. You were heard. The, the point being, this is the board who has final say in the adoption of any zoning bylaw change. <coughs> I can't emphasize enough. Be here for that hearing, the public hearing on bylaw adoption. That's that's three voices we heard. If you can't get onto an agenda, I, I can just tell you there there are a lot of folks out there who have different items they'd like to see changed in zoning bylaws. They can't all happen in, in one or two or three meetings. These things develop over time. It's, and we understand that. Yeah. But this was a mistake that the select board made, well, and that's not my work. Understood. I, and I, and I, I've had the conversation with Todd because I'm not on the board now, but I'm back. <laughs> we were trying to solve an issue that had arisen in that one neighborhood. In Fairwood Parkway. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the change we adopted at that time was to remove the multifamily residential designation. What we didn't understand was that we were removing it across the board throughout town. Mm -hmm. Our focus was on a room full of folks from Fairwood Parkway, much the same as we have Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights area here tonight. See, I don't. We thought we were resolving an issue by Todd had suggested we could remove. He was trying to find that common ground. To accomplish what we needed, and he suggested removing that. Well, we, we I know for myself, it's for me, I didn't realize we were removing it through all medium density residential across no. the town. I thought we were talking about a specific neighborhood. <coughs> Five years later, we have an instance that's occurred now with the Faith Funeral Home, and it brings to light that our decision back then has had an impact on the Faith family now. So they are again trying to find a zoning bylaw change that could be adopted to resolve that without any protracted legal battle with the Faith family, when we know it's a multi-family residential zone neighborhood. Your voices were heard clearly, folks, that, that you do not want high-density residents. <coughs> that was heard clearly. And I think they're, they're continuing to work on this. I think as an agenda item, I don't know if it's going to come back up again before the hearing. I, I just don't know. Uh, so Brian, you want Lots to say suggestions something? Suggestions have been made. So I would, I keep hearing we made a mistake, but I think in my mind, we we were trying to fix something that went up awry up there. When we did it, it should have been over the whole town. To me, you're not supposed to be spot, spot zoning. Zone. You're supposed to, right, no spot zoning. So you don't pick this house over here and, and pick it out and zone it just so this can be. So I think it's we did the right thing. Now maybe we can fix it by changing something, but not just one house, it'd be that whole area then, maybe it'd have to go back, in my opinion. But again, it needs to be done at the other planning, down there and then brought back to us. But. Call us too, I would encourage folks not to wait for the two hours a month, just as Tom has mentioned. The meeting, the meeting nights can't go on forever. Those are why those loans are put in place to try and give equal voice to everyone in town that wants to have a voice. But the folks you pay for a staff here in this building, 40 hours a week, call us, ask us questions, because I'm happy that I spent a long time on the phone today with another resident. She was tickled to get the explanations, because they are not simple. They aren't easy. The town government has a process, many of them built in, but how those flow is a mystery of many folks, and I'm happy to explain that. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Come on up. Please introduce yourself. Gary Graves, which at the planning council meeting, I spoke, but it wasn't Gary Graves in the minutes. 
Yes, just a, one of many errors that were there. Having lived on Brooklyn Street for a long time, I've seen the number of housing units go up to 93. This is on the west side of the lower Brooklyn Street for 19. I mean, it gives you some idea of how long it's been, but I mean, that's uh, not quite a 400% increase in the number of housing units that have occurred on that street. Now, years ago, you know, Steve Lee is still here, and he used to cause a lot of traffic back up with the train when it would do the shifting. And that back up seldom ever got up to the pool. And that was sometimes five or ten minutes of time. I mean, and now it happens daily. Um, just two or three times a day. Uh, the e-bicycles that go by on sidewalks. Increasing number of those. I mean, they go fast. But have, trailers on them, which take up almost all the sidewalks. And for people that are walking the pedestrians, I mean, I don't know why somebody has to get hurt. I've seen one elderly person fall as a result of that. I'm surprised I haven't seen more. But traffic, bicycle traffic, and e-bikes, and just wanted to point out that the west side of Oakland Street, the number of housing units is increased. I think it's 389 per se, rather than 400. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Mary Lynn Nichols. I do live in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, what I was concerned about is this was my friend of mine. Oh, it's about the transparency. I've read all through these minutes, and I've read a lot of uh, some things that people have done research. Uh, we have one particular person that's done eight pages of research on a lot of disinformation, and um, I know on four occasions that it was suggested that. And I don't want to blame, like, say, Todd said or Graham said. Or, it's not, this is not what this is about. This is about transparency. And if something was said, and it's not in the minutes, and some people then revert back and say, but this is what we did, and this is what we thought. So I'm suggesting that we are in 2022 and moving into 2023. We're growing, going to Todd, 500 addresses a year or whatever, but I think we ought to rock it into the 21st century with having Zoom all these meetings. So people can be heard correctly, and we're not assuming what somebody said or what somebody meant. Because like you say, you've been on the board for so many years, other people come on the board, they weren't there, they don't know what's going on, they say we have minutes. Someone will say, well maybe, that's, well what really, what we were really trying to do was fix this. Oh, we didn't realize that the zoning meant when we fixed that, it was going to be all wrong. That's transparency. And that's the things that people are asking now. Let's go back and fix this because it wasn't very transparent that the people made the decisions. They weren't aware of what was really going on. They voted on something or they said, we didn't, afterwards they're saying, well, we didn't realize it's meant the whole area. So my suggestion is that go ahead and spend the money, rock it into the 21st century, put all of this on Zoom, so we're not trying to guess each other and start accusing each other of somebody said, this one said, that one said, I mean, making things polarized. We have enough problem right now in our country and in our town with polarization of people thinking one way and thinking the other and causing a lot of emotional upset, when really we need to use our intelligence emotional intelligence and our intelligence quotient. So 
So that's my suggestion, is please let's get the documentation of a lot of these meetings down pat so we're not guessing what could have happened, should have, would have, could have. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. Is there any other business to come before the board? Can I just put a plug in the elections next Tuesday? Come vote after an absentee ballot if you have it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Yep. When you're ready. No, I'm ready. Right. Yeah, right. I, I just have a promise. Just one second. Come on, please, to introduce yourself. <coughs> Sharon Rowell, I do not live in Brooklyn Heights. <gasps> um, oh. We heard a group, a group, and they're, well, we're doing our homework, like you did, and thank you for going to school, or school. All right, so we have school capacity. We have sewer capacity. Morrisville Water and Life says no on the electricity. They're projecting brownouts this summer. That kind of tells me that we should perhaps be very concerned about the escalating growth. Thank you. All right. I move to find that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. I make a motion to enter into executive session to discuss confidenti confidential attorney-client communications made for the purposes of providing professional legal services subject to T1 VSA section 313A1F to include town administrator Eric Dodge. And before we second that, I have a, another motion, but we need to second that and vote on that. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I further move to go into executive session because I find that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. I make a motion to enter into executive session to discuss employment performance subject to T1 VSA section 313A3 to include the town administrator, Eric Dodge, recreation coordinator, Anna McCormick, and human resources director, Paula Beattie. I have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye